Welcome to the Achievable FINRA podcast. I'm Tyler, founder of Achievable, and we have affordable FINRA courses for the SIE Series 6, 7, 63, 65, and 66 with industry best pass rates. Each Achievable course includes everything you need to pass the first time, such as a full textbook, videos on key topics, thousands of questions backed by our memory enhancing algorithm, and full length practice exams. You can try them out for free by visiting Achievable.me, and if you like it, the code PODCAST gets you 10% off at checkout. Now, let's get started. Today, we've got Jason and Andrew from IBIS Prep on the line with us, and do you guys mind introducing yourselves, maybe starting with Andrew, uh, for the people that didn't listen to the last one? Sure, it's a pleasure. My name is Andrew Dennis. I'm the owner and founder of IBIS Prep, where we have an instructor for every subject under the sun, and we are aiming to revolutionize education one student at a time. I'm trying to work on my my radio pitch like you got down to a to a science <laughs> Tyler. I gotta I've get, done it a few times. <laughs> dude, dude, I gotta say, man, your voice is like built for this, man. Like you sound like it's almost like a Howard Stern voice, right? Yeah, man. Hey, oh, thank you. I appreciate hey, that. Yeah. I, I, I can't. I can't. And this is how I sound, you know. But um, yeah, I have a test prep company and. We, we just want to help people. We do professional licensing. Our, our main professional licensing departments are the bar exams, Florida, California, and the UBE, um, and then the securities exams, Series 7, 66, and the SIE. We're based in Miami, Florida. We do live tutoring here, a lot around the University of Miami area. I'm a graduate of the University of Miami. I have a JD MBA. Um, we do all subjects for children and for adults. We do the LSAT, uh, GMAT, GRE. But we really like the professional licensing exams because it's it's powerful to help people at such an impactful stage of their life. And for me, one thing I was going to say, because we're not going to do the mindfulness episode, but I did want to mention that um, we all, I think everyone here, Tyler, Jason, and myself, we understand that taking this exam is not just about learning the material. It's also about executing on test day. So you want to make sure that you're in a good position to take the test and you do all the things that are necessary and it's a long process and people like us are, are here to help you figure out what's uh, what's best for you. And um, I, I take the, I took the SIE in the Series 7 on the same day, so I know uh, how much of a, of a difficult exam it is. And um, what we're here to talk about today, suitability. That's like the biggest thing to understand is matching these products up to the specific uh, needs. And there's no one better in the mm-hmm. world to teach people about that than Jason, who is our head of our securities department. And uh, he's created he created a bunch of our materials that we have. Um, and I will say that students always tell us that our suitability worksheets are enlightening because, you know, Jason really did his diligence on them. So great to well, be here. I also here. worked in compliance for five years, too. That helps. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Jason, if you don't mind introducing yourself real quick, and then let's sure, jump right sure, into sure. suitability. I, uh, my name is Jason. I'm actually the, the lead tutor at Ibis Prep, and um, my my day job is uh, I'm a financial planner. I've been a financial planner for about, uh, about 20, 23, 24 years now. Um, worked in the business practically my entire career. Um, currently managing a you know a large practice uh, at Ameriprise uh, here in Coral Gables, Florida, so um, I don't know. I don't see myself doing doing anything else. But you know, I, I figured yeah. you know, the tutoring thing for me was a great way to give back because I think you know we're we're kind of at this stage where you know the baby boomers are starting to retire, and you know we need to kind of have this this influx of of new advisors to kind of figure out how they're going to come in and take over some of these practices because you know these these people still need planning. I mean, it doesn't matter whether their advisor retires or passes away or what have you. Planning still needs to exist and it still needs to happen. So. So that's kind of where, you know, I think the whole tutoring thing for me is, you know, kind of giving back and, you know, kind of building the bench, so to speak. That's mm-hmm. kind of how I look at it. So, but yeah, so, yeah. you know, you know, we said we're going to talk about suitability. So, um, yeah, it's, it's 70% of the series seven, right? It is. <laughs> Pretty well, much. And it's, and it's a hundred percent of your daily life as a financial planner. So, <laughs> right. So it makes sense that it's, it's pretty relevant. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's been a hot topic, I think for the last probably, I'd say going on about 10 years now, um, you know, when FINRA comes in and does their audits, that's, that's primarily where they're going first. 
is they're they're doing a lot of suitability reviews. So, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to, you know, these exams, that's why it's tested so heavily because I think, you know, when you get into the real world, you know, you need to have a, a real clear, comprehensive understanding of how the risk and the investment objectives and the products kind of all relate to each other so that, you know, you have the correct, you know, suitability and investment objectives associated with a particular account for a client. Right. And maybe just just since we're at the beginning of the episode, I think it is worth maybe just a quick second on. So what does this suitability word mean? And I mean, the, the, the short version of it is uh, if you remember The Wolf of Wall Street, and if you haven't watched that movie, you you can understand this analogy anyway. There's a great scene where uh, the main character, you know, basically sells a worthless penny stock to like a doctor or something. Um, and, it, you know, this guy is looking for money to go into like his child's college fund and he takes it and he puts it on an extremely high risk thing, which naturally nets a great commission for the main character, but also most likely, I don't even think they follow up on it, but it most likely blows up in the actual customer's face. And so that is in a lot of ways, it's the purpose of FINRA nowadays. It's certainly the purpose of the securities act of 1933, but also FINRA today is to protect customers, right? Um, and to make sure that, you know, unlike in crypto, <laughs> which is going to get these laws pretty soon, I Correct. Bet, yep. um, there's no, uh, you know, you're not rewarded for selling a false bill of goods or false promises to people. And you're at least attempting to sell people what they're asking for. Right. So that's kind of what suitability is about. It's about what is based on what this person's looking for, what they're asking for, like what is actually the best thing for them and what are the products that are appropriate for them from a risk profile point of view? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's my side tangent definition. No, I think that's a great definition of it <laughs> because I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's really what, what it's about because, you know, when they come in and start looking, you know, that's, that's where they go. They, they look at, you know, clients age, they look at their holdings, they look at their income, you know, where, you know, we, we do it all the time because we have limitations until we do a lot of structured notes. And, you know, with structures, you know, we can't have a client who has more, they can't have, you know, assets and structures that are more than 30% of their, you know, liquid net worth. So, you know, there's reasons for that. And the reasons are, are you know, because of the Enrons of the world and the Sam Bankman Freeds of the world. And, you know, I agree with you. I think crypto is going to get regulated. And, you know, suitability is is the reason why that it's probably going to get regulated. So when, you know, when when we meet with a client, it's the first thing we do is sit down with them and talk to them about, you know, how do they feel about investing? You got to ask some kind of a, a emotionally involved questions because you want to get real answers from the client and the answers they give you are what you have to to go by. And, you know, for purposes of the test, when we talk about, you know, suitability and what, what does that mean? It's, it's kind of subjective. I hate to say that. And and that's the, that's the, the kind of caveat that goes along with these tests is that, you know, my view of a conservative investor could be very different from, you know, Andrew's views of what a conservative investor would be or conservative products for that. Just, it's, it's just a matter of, how you define it. But for purposes of the test, it's black and white. And that's the good news is that it's, it's cut and dry. It's very, it's laid out in a form where if you follow the format, you'll get it right every time. And in the real world, it's a little different. There's a little gray. Some compliance departments have no gray. Mine, of course, has no gray. But... (laughs) But, you know, again, it's, it's, if you understand it, you know, there's things that you can do because a client, you know, that's the other, thing, the other question that a lot of students ask is, well, what if a client wants an aggressive account and they want a conservative account? How do they do that? Well, they have two separate accounts. That's it. That's how you can do it. And mm-hmm. that's perfectly allowable by FINRA because whatever's in the conservative account could be all fixed income if you want to do that for the client because they want the coupon payments and then in their other account would be their equities and their you know, their options and their structures, whatever it may be. So, so, so when it comes to talking about 
the first piece, which I always say is the risk profile of the client, right? There, there's three, you know, classes, right? We've got conservative, right? Moderate and aggressive. And then there's also, you know, some places in between there. We could be moderately conservative or moderately aggressive, right? But if we know what those three are and what they mean, then it will help us kind of determine which street we need to drive down when it comes yep. to the client, right? So conservative, right? Conservative means just that. The client is looking for low volatility, right? So we're going to be on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of risk. So when we talk about moderate, we're probably looking at what we call balanced, right? A balanced portfolio, meaning we might have some conservative and some aggressive to balance things out so that it's somewhere in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the last one, aggressive, right? That's like off the charts. I don't care what happens to my money, you know. That's that's what we call like the I want to be rich. a millionaire. That's right. Yeah, you know they don't y- care. Yolo, right? Yolo, right? You only live yeah. once. That's right. Put it all in GameStop calls right. at three fifty. Like, yeah, bet to it all moon. on black. Right. That's right. So, so when it comes to you know those those three categories, you know there are certain kinds of, of, of products, right, or things that you can use with each of those. So I always say you know for conservatives, you're you're looking at fixed income, government securities, like. You know, T-bills, T-notes, T-bonds, um, muni bonds fit into that category. Government-backed securities like Ginny's, um, you know, Freddie Mac, you know, Freddie and Fannie. Money market securities like CDs, bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, right? Mm-hmm. Commercial paper. How many days? I always tell everybody, 270 days or less. That's on the test. Mm-hmm. It's over 270 days. It is a security. It is no longer a money market instrument. So... And then you've got like secure bonds and you know, general obligation bonds, zero coupons. Yeah, all the U.S. government debt, right? And your municipal debt, all the above. Exactly. I used, to, I used to tell students that the safest investment in the world, in theory, is a T-bill because it's the shortest duration, it's a government-backed uh, security, and it's backed by the good old United States of America. So in theory, that's like the safest investment you could ever make is T-bills. Yep. And uh the riskiest investment is probably uh, probably penny stocks or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pennies, structured products, those kinds of things. You know, structures are complex instruments. Options too. I mean, you know, again, they're they're considered high risk from a compliance yep. standpoint. But basically, when it's conservative, it's products with low or no risk. That's kind of what we say. And then, of course, on the test, you know, Andrew mentioned T bills. And, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll use what's called the term risk free rate, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And I know that that's been in some of the test materials. And when we talk about yep. the risk free rate, it's, it's the 30 day T bill return or yield. That's what it is. Right. So. Because that assumes that the, the least amount of money you could ever make is what you would get in a T bill, not nothing. Because you might as well put it in a T bill instead of just have it in the piggy bank. Correct. That's the risk-free rate. Yeah, interesting. Correct, correct. Right. So yeah, as far as the test goes, I think when you're when you're outlining conservative, moderate, and aggressive, I think it's probably important to just say like, what are the things that you know you're talking about? The test is black and white about suitability. What is for sure in the conservative column on the test, right? Because the test yep. is going to ask questions like, Joe Bob has a million dollars and he wants X for retirement, and he has a conservative strategy. Like, and what would you, you know, they give you a bunch of hints that this guy is in a certain archetype. Like, it's like, he's 60 years old, et cetera, et cetera. What should he do, right? Or what would you recommend first? And so there's a, there's a only one right answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, what are the key things to look out for, for conservative since we started there? So fixed, yeah, fixed income. A- anything pr- primarily fixed income with the exception of, you know, revenue bonds, Corporate bonds, unsecured bonds, right? High yield, right? Those four options mm-hmm. would be out. But anything fixed income, anything that we can tuck into the bank, right? Anything that is guaranteed, right? Mm-hmm. Would fall into that conservative realm, like a fixed annuity, for example. Um, mm-hmm. Secured bonds, but anything with the word US in front of it is yep. always good 
for how about concern. A, so. how, how about a debenture? Um, no, that would probably <laughs> fall into moderate or aggressive because debentures are junk bonds, so to speak, right? Debenture, so. and there's, a, there's another one that sounds good, but it's not... But Revenue it's good. bonds. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Revenue bonds... Those do sound good. They sound like fixed income and bond combined. That's why that's I said, right? Case, those right? four. So Revenue, corporate, debentures, right? Those are mm-hmm. out because... Mm-hmm. Revenue bonds are bonds that are basically paid if the company has revenue to pay you, which is likely not going to happen because they're probably in some form of, you know, chapter 13 reorganization when they're doing it. Corporate yeah. bonds, that's tied also, to corporate profits. And then debentures are, are debentures basically that are unsecured. It's backed by the full think, faith and credit of the company. So I think just to clarify, income bonds are the ones that are on the brink of bankruptcy. Oh, that's rev- right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yes. A rev right. bond is like a geo and a rev bond or muni bonds. And I, I agree with you. A geo bond is definitely more conservative than a rev bond. But the ones that I was thinking of were income bonds that's it. and debentures. They sound like they're nice, but they're they're very risky. <laughs> right. No, thanks for yeah, the correction. They, especially with the word bond in the title. That always gets you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anything U.S. Treasury, would you say like U.S. state municipal is also pretty good at that mm-hmm. point? Yep. Yeah. So we're you're, you're looking at the safest of the safe. Yep. And if it's not obvious, then think harder about what <laughs> about <laughs> your question or the answers, because the safe stuff should be really straightforward. Yep. 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 Um, and, and you talked about, too, Jason, like Ginny Mays, Sally Mays, those like uh, they're they're pretty moderate. Those. um. What would we call them? Well, Ginny's and government sponsored securities. Yeah. Yeah, those government sponsored securities. They're pretty pretty conservative too. Yeah, yeah, and they are, and and you know, Ginny's backed by the federal government, but Fannie and Freddie aren't. But you know, Fannie and Freddie are they're basically like a loan company, so they do a lot of like CMOs and stuff like that. But they they primarily do a lot of loans for like our servicemen and women, which is you know always a good investment. So. And they do have some level of backing, you know, from the federal government where God forbid something happens and the federal government will step in and kind of help out. But that's yeah. definitely, definitely tested on every seven is that yeah, no. are the, they're the only ones backed by the full faith and credit yep. of the U.S. government. Yeah, that's why I said it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's that's very important, and the good news is, as of today, twenty twenty three, uh, the full backing of the U.S. government is the best thing you can have in this financial market. Yep, and we'll probably stay that way. Knock on wood. For yeah, I think the fixed income market is going to start to roar here shortly, as long as the Fed keeps increasing interest rates. So, yeah, yeah, that that's a that's a whole another episode we could do someday. Of course, yeah, <laughs> talking about that so, relationship. So, should we go into moderate? You want to? Yeah, go let's moderate? do moderate now. So, yeah. So with moderate, you know, we're talking about, like I said, those revenue bonds, right? Corporate bonds, unsecured bonds, right? The debentures, they would fall into that category. But then we also have like preferred stock, right? Because it's a stock. It, it acts like a, you know, it's, it's, it's sensitive to interest because it's, it's kind of like a hybrid where there's, you know, a little bit of fixed income and, you know, a little bit of equity. But then we have mutual funds, right? Depending on the type of mutual fund that it is, but you know, mutual funds that are, let's say, large cap, mid cap, right? Those kinds of things. Not bonds, not fixed income mutual funds. Even um, it, what, I, what, what I'm gathering is it's like a kind of a, a scale, you know, like you said earlier, there's moderate to aggressive, but there's moderate aggressive, moderate conservative. And, you know, you could argue that a high cap stock is moderate or aggressive, but if you put it on a scale... The preferred stock is definitely more moderate than the common stock. Yeah. The the reasons you were saying. Hundred yeah. percent. Yep. Yep. It's why the it's why kind of uh, financial advisors exist. If all of these were kind of solved problems, then you could just go to a computer and be like, "Put my money in the best place," and then it would be done. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right. Just just a just a quick aside. You know, I, in my business, we do um you know help students with with essay writing. And now there's these robots in New York, that application where the computers are writing essays for kids. So now I have to compete against robots for uh, academic services. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, hey, the, uh, advisors have competed with robo-advisors for like, I don't know, 10 years now. And they yep. seem to be doing okay. So 
Right. I think that there's um I think that there's a bit of a there's a there's a bit of art to it still. There is. But yes, is. like you said, it's there's a gradient. When risk is probably best described as like a number line from zero to a hundred. Where zero is no risk, like literally everything is in a mattress under your bed and six lock boxes, and you sit with a shotgun at night <laughs> and never sleep. That's I guess that's as close as you can get to zero absolute risk. And then on the other side, you're at like a hundred percent risk, which is I don't know. You've put absolutely everything on on the worst uh, call option that ever exists, right? So it's a naked it, call it, on a penny every, stock. That's right. Yeah, exactly. A go. naked naked thousand dollar call on a penny stock or something crazy. So <laughs> you get so everything else is somewhere in the middle. Um and you know, we're we're trying to kind of divide it into I would say like almost like twenty five, fifty, twenty five, right? You yeah. got the twenty five most conservative, you'd call conservative, fifty is the middle is messy and it's the moderate, and then twenty five is the aggressive. I would completely agree. Yep. Yeah, so then maybe now, I think, like, moderate's kind of everything else, right? So maybe it's good to talk about the aggressive uh, the aggressive stuff in suitability and where you're going to see that on the test in particular. Because at least from what I understand, um, it seems to test the conservative side a lot more than the aggressive side, like making sure that you're being safe with a, with a safety-first customer. Uh, but still, it does show up on the test the other way. I know it does. I, I just remembered my little saying. I, I'm a I'm a funny guy when I teach, and I always have these little sayings. But I had income bonds produce no income, and guaranteed bonds are guaranteed to suck because guaranteed bonds and income bonds are those two terms that sound like they're conservative, but they're actually risky because guaranteed means guaranteed by a third party, a third party business. That's not a very secure thing. It's not even guaranteed by the company itself. And then income mm-hmm. bonds, like we said, are more or less junk bonds, but they trick you on the test because you see those words income bond and guaranteed and you're like, oh, these are good, but they're actually very uh, aggressive. Yeah, aggressive. no, it's a good call out. Appreciate that. Yeah. So, so those are aggressive. going back what, to aggressive, yeah. right? we were talking about aggressive, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So common stock, obviously, right? Common stock mm-hmm. of a company is considered aggressive. Um low cap stocks so you know companies that have low capitalization right sounds an awful lot like penny stocks or what we call micro cap stocks these days again tend to be more aggressive why <laughs> because there's a lot more volatility in the price hedge funds obviously options margin accounts right borrowing money mm-hmm. to buy things that's always great right let's borrow money get charged interest to buy things that may go down in value and owe more money wonderful right Right. We can do it. We can do it. <laughs> yeah, that, that exists if you does. want it. That's you right. mentioned something, Jason, too, that I think people don't understand. A hedge fund is inherently risky. People would think that it's a very safe, conservative investment oh, no, because they yeah. – but that's exact. by definition, a hedge fund is full of risk. And I always well, tell it's, everybody, it's, you know, when it comes to hedge funds, what did Bernie Madoff manage? A hedge fund. <laughs> right. Was mm-hmm. it a safe place to invest? <laughs> no, right? Not safe. Aggressive investments. Why? Because you could be swindled by the people who are managing the hedge fund. Why? Because they're unregulated. They can do whatever the heck they want to do. And right. That's the that's the advantage to hedge funds is that they're unregulated, but disadvantage to investors is that they're unregulated. Right. So. Well, and that's that's also it's it's an important survivorship bias uh, example where you only hear about the hedge funds that do well. Yep. There are plenty of hedge funds that don't do well, and yep. they just don't go on the news and say we lost ten billion dollars this year. Like, got it. They know it's better to stay quiet, yep. Yep. <laughs> right? And then when they hit the big win, then they go on the news, and you're like, damn, I should get in this hedge fund. So yeah, definitely and, risky. And I think too, like with aggressive, you know, a good thing just to remember is you know usually all equity. Or specialized investments are considered an aggressive investment. I think that's probably mm-hmm. the easiest way to sum it up. Yeah, and then that that I would even say, in addition to that, even you know, you were talking about like a like uh, common stock versus preferred stock. I don't even know if preferred stock has you escape aggressive category or not, or if it's still aggressive. I guess it. I mean, do you think that there's enough delineation between say? 
high growth tech and like general motors or do you think that it's just for the sake of the exams all equities are risky no for for the sake of the seven that they're they're not going to break it down in, in the sie they're not going right. to break it down into into that it's it's really just like i said the equity position that's why i said usually all equity right all equity or you know highly specialized investments like options or things that are relatively complicated would fall it, into that aggressive category it, just like we talked about in our in our options uh podcast a lot of it comes down to vocabulary if you just know what they're talking about and you know then you can think about if it's a aggressive or a conservative uh type of investment like you know now that hedge fund mm-hmm. that vocabulary word signifies aggressive small cap aggressive large cap is more on the conservative side but then they'll have words like a sector fund or they'll have words like defensive stocks and you know you just kind of mm-hmm. really want to make sure you know what the vocabulary word means and i think this is great to have in your mind almost like a timeline where on the one end is yolo naked calls on penny stocks <laughs> on the other end is t bills and then you can kind of put everything in a sliding scale in order and I think right in the middle is probably like the mutual funds and the ETFs, I would think. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, like you said, Tyler, you were talking about that 25, 50, 25, right? When it comes to, you know, like portfolio allocations, like what's an aggressive portfolio allocation? Well, anything that's 80% or greater in equities is considered aggressive, right? Mm-hmm. Moderate, 50, 50, right? And then conservative would be the other way, 80, 20, right? 80 in fixed income, 20 in equities. But as we kind of migrate towards that, you know, outside of 80% getting into 70, you know, that it's kind of like a gray area, but that's where that like moderately conservative or moderately aggressive would be. So I always tell everybody when it comes to aggressive portfolios, anything that has 80% or more in equities is going to be an aggressive portfolio, at least for purposes of the test. Yep. Totally agree. And then on suitability, let's let's just uh, I think the sort of good last thing to cover here on this podcast is to talk about how it shows up on the test mm-hmm. and like how how you diagnose the question to to get what they're really asking for. Well, one thing I would just mention is we were talking about these products and where they align from conservative to aggressive, but you also need to know about what is the objective of the investor because mm. It's not just do they need a conservative risky investment. They also might have an income based objective or a growth based objective. So it's kind of this, you know, matchmaker game where you have to look at the client profile, see what their risk tolerance is, see what their objectives are, and any other consider, maybe they have tax considerations, whatever it may be. And then you take that profile and you put them into the best of the four answer choices that they give you. I mean, that's, that's the approach, I would say. But you, no, you definitely have. You have to make sure that you're not just matching their risk tolerance, but you're also achieving their objective. And that's a whole separate understanding of the products. You need to know which products will produce income, which products are geared towards growth and and those type of things as well. So let's talk about that then, right? So when we talk about, like you said, capital appreciation, right? So if we're looking for capital appreciation, right, it's going to be stocks, mutual funds, ETFs primarily, right, that have, you know, higher equity positions, right? Protection of principal, government security, zero coupons, general obligation mm-hmm. bonds, right? Income, bonds, preferred stock, or anything with dividends or coupons, right? Tax treatment. Tax treatment's a, a slippery slope, right? Because you've got the tax retirement triangle. So you got to think about, okay, pre-tax versus taxable versus tax-free, right? Mm-hmm. Which we always talk about municipal bonds when it comes to tax treatment, right? So for our wealthier clients, we put them in munis, but we, we got to look at, you know, the state and local tax issue for you. So that's something that you got to consider. And then the other one's liquidity, right? You know, is the client going to need money in the next six months or 12 months or three months, right? So do we have to, you know, make sure that we keep a portion of those assets in what we call, you know, highly liquid investments like stocks, mutual funds, you know, those kind of things that are readily tradable as opposed to things like real estate hedge funds, right? or long maturity bonds or annuities with no, surrender sure. charges that are relatively illiquid in that respect mm-hmm. or cost the customer money. So, and then there's always, you know, these two little things that, that I've always said to, to students is when it comes to, you know, suitability and like their investment objectives, if you have a client and it says the client's looking for a death benefit, 
the answer will always be life insurance. And if you see, you know, a term where it says the client doesn't want to outlive their money, the answer That's will annuity. always be an annuity, right? Because if they mm-hmm. don't want to outlive their money, that's how a client can create, you know, a pension for themselves. So those are two things that kind of fit into those investment judgments. But then going back to, like you said, how do they do it on the test, right? They're going to tell you you have a young client who makes so much money or is potentially in a tax bracket with a risk tolerance, right? What do we use, right? So when it comes to age, something that I've, I've always told my students is the best way to determine, you know, for the test is to determine how much of your client's portfolio should be in equities is to use 100 minus the client's age. And whatever number <laughs> is closest to that on the test I like that. I like that. is likely going to be the right answer. I like yep. that. Right? I'd never heard that. I like that. So me, I'm 33. So 67, I should be 67 in equities. You got it. Yep. That's it. All right. Yeah. Today I learned that my portfolio is, is extremely aggressive according to hundred percent in equities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm all, I'm all equities. So eh, it's okay. there's nothing wrong doing. with that. Right. But, but in, in the real world, right. That's kind of how, when we look at these, these strategies that FINRA is looking at, that's what they look at. They look at the client's age. And one of the things these examiners are doing is they're taking a hundred minus the client's age and saying, okay, this client is a hundred percent in equities, right? At age eighty-two, <laughs> right. right? Problem might want to take some money off the table at that point. Correct, right? So that, you know, does that client should they have eighty percent in equities? Well, then they'll look at okay, this account's aggressive, this one's moderate, this one's conservative. They have three accounts. Okay, now we understand. But if it's one account and it's all in equities, you better have a darn good reason, you know, to show Finra, hey. This is why we're doing it this way because this is what the client told me he wanted. There's something yep. there's something fun about suitability. It's like you get this imaginary person and you're picking out a, an outfit for them that's gonna, you know, fit them best. Like <laughs> I like I like doing suitability problems. I mean the emperor it, has no clothes. It, it does it, it does, you know, force you to generalize a little bit. Like it does. Yeah. Right. And and one thing that I always remember as a big objective is retirement. People want mm-hmm. income in retirement. They want to, like you said, not outlive their money. So it's cool. Yeah. And especially if you think about it as an individual, you know, what are your objectives? What's your risk tolerance? And if you can kind of, you know, uh, examine yourself and, and, and recommend something for yourself, that's a good start. And then you can kind of start to fit products for different types of profiles. Um, yep. Yeah. And I think the, the last thing, um, that I would, I would chip in here is, is that there's always one right answer. That's a really important thing to remember when you're looking at this test and you, it, it's the type of question where it feels like there are multiple right answers, like somewhat often. And you, if, if you're ever thinking that you, you're like, one of these has to be wrong and there has to be a reason why it's wrong. And if you can't figure that out, well, then maybe you need to guess, but like, you should have that lens on it. The The way that these tests are written, they are legally obligated to have only one possible correct answer per question, because otherwise you could sue them and say, I should have passed. And they also have to have a justification for any wrong answer being wrong. So you got to look at it with that lens when you're looking at suitability and make sure that you're like, all right, the, you know, I know this one's wrong for this reason. I know what this one's wrong for this reason. Um, when you're answering these questions. And that's a great point because you know, I, I always tell my students, the wonderful thing about this test is they give you the right answer. It's in one of those four choices. Right. Right. It's a step in the right direction. So it's not I like will. a, it's not like an essay, right? Or like, I guess, you know, you know, like with the bar, right? There's an essay. You got to write an essay. If they don't like it. They grade it. Right. But with this, it's the answer is there. It's staring at you right in the face. Three yep. essays, Jason, <laughs> the bar is three essays. But I, I will say one thing, and you know, not to make everyone think it's an easy test. By no means are the securities exams easy. And what is tough is they have the answer choices where it will be like two and three, or one, two oh. and three. You know, that sucks because most exams don't have that, and the securities exams do have that, which is not my favorite thing. I'm sure. And the accept questions—that's the other one, 
right? All of the following, yeah. except, right? So that's where I always, I give everybody my Sesame Street analogy. Which one of these is not like the other? Remember that song from Sesame <laughs> yeah. Street? So, yeah. And that's, it's a tough, that's, it's, it's a tough, tough test, but what we talked about in the, the two episodes, options, suitability, if you can master those two subjects, that's a huge portion of the exam. Yep. Yeah, stuff. I mean, if you if you master options and suitability, you should pass the series seven. Knock on wood, because you, I mean, to get to that point, you'll have to have known everything else. Mm -hmm. That's like the foundational stuff under it. <laughs> um, but yeah, th those are by far the most tested topics on this te on that test, and with the with these two episodes, hopefully, it helps you uh, master them. Yeah, absolutely. Glad we could do it. Great. Well, this has been the Achievable Finra podcast hosted by Tyler from Achievable with Jason and Andrew from Ibis Prep. And Achievable has courses for the Finra SIE Series 6, 7, 63, 65, and 66 exams with industry best pass rates that you can try out for free by visiting our website, achievable.me. That was a long sentence. And if you like it, you can use the code podcast to get 10% off at checkout.